Good afternoon from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephen Clark from spaceflightnow.com and welcome to our live coverage of another launch from here on Florida Space Coast. Today's mission is named Transporter 5. You're looking live at a Falcon 9 rocket where uh, the rocket is standing on pad 40 at this hour, one hour, 19 minutes from liftoff. This mission will be carrying 59 small satellites and hosted experiments into orbit. This is SpaceX, SpaceX's fifth dedicated rideshare mission, hence the name Transporter 5, and the third transporter mission this year. This mission will be carrying uh, small payloads into orbit for a range of customers, commercial customers, as well as NASA, the U.S. Missile Defense Ag Agency. The, all these payloads will be uh, placed into a, a polar orbit about 525 kilometers or roughly 325 miles above Earth. One special note about today's mission, the first stage booster on the Falcon 9 rocket will be returning to a landing at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station targeting a vertical descent and touchdown on landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station about eight and a half minutes after liftoff. Launch is currently scheduled for 2.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time that's 18.27 UTC. Landing of the first stage about eight and a half minutes later at landing zone one. This will be SpaceX's 22nd Falcon 9 launch of the year and the eighth flight of this particular reusable booster, booster number 1061. SpaceX rolled the Falcon 9 rocket out to a pad 40 from its hangar just south of the pad overnight and raised it vertical early this morning in preparation for today's countdown. Over the past a few hours, ground teams at pad 40 have completed their uh, hands-on work. And they uh, should have or should be now uh, leaving the launch complex in preparation for the start of cryogenic tanking. Uh, super cold or super chilled densified kerosene fuel as well as liquid oxygen will be loaded into the two stage Falcon 9 beginning at T minus 35 minutes. That's about 32 minutes from now. And at that point, the countdown will be running on an automated computer sequencer governing the last 35 minutes of the countdown, culminating in liftoff of the Falcon 9 at 2.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time.
T minus 58 minutes and 15 seconds and counting. Less than an hour away now from launch of uh, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket on the Transporter 5 mission. This mission will be carrying 59 small satellites and research experiments into a polar orbit. Uh, alongside the numerous satellites that will be deploying from the uh, Falcon 9 rocket is a hosted payload from NanoRacks. This hosted payload, payload will be testing a new, new technology to demonstrate the cutting of metals in orbit. The payload is self-contained a, inside a box that will remain mounted to the Falcon 9 upper stage after it reaches orbit. And the, the experiment will run just a few minutes, but it will be demonstrating a technology that NanoRex and other companies hope to use to advance in space manufacturing. This uh, view from NanoRack shows what the uh, payload looks like fixed to the uh, deployment rings on top of the upper stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. Again, the experiment is contained inside uh, these containers uh, featuring a small robotic arm and a friction milling device on the end of that robotic arm to uh, cut some metal coupons, uh, sta uh, corrosion resistant stainless steel uh, coupons that are uh, uh, similar to materials used in rocket stages. Eventually, NanoRex uh, aims to uh, develop the technology to convert a spent rocket stages, upper stages, that are uh, left in orbit after their missions are complete into research platforms and pressurized habitats. And this is an artist's concept of what one of those uh, converted uh, salvaged rocket stages may look like. You can see the engines no longer necessary at the uh, left side of the screen in this artist's concept. And uh, the pressurized propellant tanks uh, containing uh, some plants. Uh, this is one concept for some of the uses of these salvaged upper stages. This idea has been around a while, but uh, NanoRax is testing technology on, th on this particular mission just after the launch that will demonstrate uh, some of the uh, techniques and uh, systems that will be required to modify a spent or used upper stage into a uh, research habitat. We spoke with Marshall Smith, who is the Vice President of Space Systems at NanoRax uh, earlier this week. He told us a little bit about this experiment, which is known as Outpost Mars Demo 1, and what can we, we can expect to uh, happen after the launch, as well as what uh, NanoRax and its partners uh, hope to uh, use, how they hope to use this technology over the next few years. Uh, the Mars uh, Demo, the uh, Outpost Mars Demo mission is launching as a payload on the rideshare uh, mission by SpaceX this week. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the specific objectives and what's new about this ex experiment? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, when I was at NASA, I left NASA about eight months ago. One of the things that I did quite a while ago was get something started that helps us build uh, in deep space. And so, you know, we're bound by the size of our vehicles that we can launch with. And if we want to really build truly large vehicles in space, go to Mars, uh, build build things on the surface of the moon and vacuums. We need to be able to actually construct in space. We need to weld, we need to cut, we need to do those types of things. And you know, nobody has actually uh, really done any uh, significant uh, uh, metal work in space. And so this will be the first experiment where we're going up and we're gonna be cutting um, a metal piece, it's a demo mission, it's a technology demo mission where we're gonna be cutting the metal piece. It's about the same, it is the same material that's used in the outer shell, shell of the ULA Vulcan Centaur. And we'll be cutting this piece without leaving any debris uh, in the process. We're partnered with Maxar Technologies, who's got a new robotic arm, uh, has a friction milling uh, end effector on it that we're using as a cutting tool to, to do this. And the whole uh, demonstration is just to show that we can do this in space. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that that's, as we move forward in, in going back to the moon and going to Mars and beyond, uh, this, this is going to be a key uh, stepping point as we move forward. And can you talk about uh, just sort of the concept of, of operations for this experiment? Uh, is it part of a free flight? Does it remain on the Falcon 9? And, and how long does this whole experiment run? Yeah, it's actually part of a, it's a self-contained experiment. 
uh, mainly because it is a test. And so we want to make sure that we don't, if there is any debris, that we, we keep it contained. So it's a contained box. It's actually flying up on the uh, uh, SpaceX Transporter 5 rideshare flight. Um, about nine minutes into the flight, uh, we will do a one minute demonstration. There'll be a uh, video uh, uh, that'll be taken and photos, et cetera. That'll all be downlinked. Uh, we'll know uh, pretty much uh, right away, we'll get a signal down that it's happening, but it'll probably take us a day or so to get all the video and uh, uh, other data down uh, so we can actually uh, monitor it and see the data uh, come forward. But it'll take about a minute and it'll be finished about uh, 10 minutes into the flight. And, uh, you know, this type of technology and capability, once it's demonstrated, uh, you know, I know you hope it's going to be demonstrated on this ex particular experiment. Um, what are the next steps to kind of expand the scale of this type of uh, operation in space? Yeah, as I said, this is an initial step, you know, that there's going to be quite a bit of work. Uh, as we move forward, you know, eventually I kind of, you might can see it way back in the corner. There's a, an upper stage that has been uh, shown to be um, uh, upgraded in use. So we fly uh, vehicles, every, every launch goes to space, about half of them actually stay in space as, as debris, orbital debris. Uh, they're putting into orbits that are, that are advantageous, but nevertheless, they're there. And so the question is, how can we use these systems in the future? How can we not, not let things turn into space junk? Can we reuse them? Can we go up and actually modify them? Uh, maybe combine them together into making something that would be useful to uh, uh, our needs. So that's one area. Uh, another area is how can we use these uh, upper stages in a way in the future? So we have another system out there that's called the MEK or Mission Extension Kit. And we'll be placing these Mission Extension Kits. They can go on any launch vehicle. Uh, and that allows them after they've done their primary mission to continue operating basically almost indefinitely uh, doing other types of missions where the upper stage can be used uh, for other opportunities. Uh, so communications, comms, uh, debris, uh, monitoring and collecting debris and those types of things. Is this type of technology uh, applicable to uh, NanoRex's concept for a commercial space station? Uh, yes, yeah, so so our concept for commercial space station, our initial one, is the one that we have on contract now with, or actually it's a, it's a, a funded space act agreement with NASA. Um, it is not connected directly to that, but it will be. These are steps. So so it's going to take several years before we get to the point where we're actually manufacturing in space. Uh, in the meantime, our first step is to do what we're doing on the uh, uh, on the uh, funded space act agreement. The a commercial LEO uh, development uh, program um, where we're actually building a, a space station and launching it uh, completely in a single, in a single launch. Um, and that will be not manufactured, it'll be built on the ground. And then eventually, you know, something like this can be used in concert with the MEK systems, uh, items going back and forth between uh, upper stages that are in space. Uh, and and the uh, initial star lab, which is that what's that vehicle is called. Um, Eventually, what we would like to have happen is be able to reuse other upper stages to build more space station capabilities. I know the Mars Demo 1, I think, was originally manifested on Transporter 3. It got bumped to Transporter 5. Uh, curious, what was uh, the reason for that? Uh, basically, we wanted to make sure everything was right, working perfectly, uh, so we we had no issues with that. Also, COVID did not help us. It was during COVID time, and we had supplier issues and things like that, like I think everybody else in the industry does. And uh, I, I think you may mention this up front, but if you didn't, uh, the you know the coupon, or for lack of a better term, of, uh, of material you're going to be working with on Mars Demo 1, how big is that? How thick is it? What can you share about that? It's pretty small, actually. You know, a lot of people think rockets are, are big, thick, and heavy things, but they're actually not because then that's mass you have to carry. So um, I don't have the exact sizes, but it's it's a small coupon. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, inches uh, coupon size. And, and get, again, the point is to demonstrate the cut to make sure that we can do it without getting any debris in the area and that it can work uh, and the whole system works perfectly. And, uh, you know, this is known as Mars Demo 1, which implies you have a Mars Demo 2 experiment in the works. We do. We, we actually, you know, call this Mars Demo 1 because, again, like I said earlier, uh, if you want to go 
into deep space, go to Mars, go to other things. We got to start building and constructing vehicles in space rather than just launching them all lock, stock and barrel, barrel on the ground. Um, so, so this is the first step toward that. And, you know, our eventual plan is to have multiple flights where we're doing more uh, uh, welding, cutting, uh, demonstrating how we do manufacturing in space. Real, you know, honest to goodness, manufacturing a building in space rather than launching things that are pre-packed. How, how can we do it uh, uh, as we move forward? So, yeah, so we, we have a whole set of uh, plans, which I probably won't, can't go into right now for multiple uh, uh, follow-ons to this. And you mentioned you expect another results within a day or so of the launch. We we believe so. It'll be kind of be up to the uh, uh, process and, and getting the data off of the whole system. But you know, we think it'll be about a day. We should get the results, video, and other things like that. Is this something? To it. Is this something you plan to share publicly immediately or sometime down the road? Well, we have to look at the video. There's some proprietary things that we want to make sure that we we don't uh, release. So when we get that video back, we'll look and see where we are. Uh, with respect to what we're what we're viewing and uh and we we hope to release it though yes okay marshall well thank you for your time and uh, good luck with this experiment great thank you and, and we're very excited about this looking forward to it now about 47 minutes until launch of spacex's falcon 9 rocket you're listening to marshall smith who is the senior vice president of space systems at nanorax Nanorax is a, a company based in Houston, and they have a lot of experience arranging access to the International Space Station uh, for commercial and scientific uh, CubeSats and small research payloads. And they have an experiment of their own on this mission. You heard Marshall Smith talk about the Outpost Mars Demo 1 experience, experiment, which will be uh, demonstrating the uh, cutting of metal, demonstrating metalworks in low Earth orbit just uh, about eight minutes or nine minutes or so after the launch of the Falcon 9 rocket, as soon as its upper stage reaches orbit, that experiment will begin, and it's going to run a few minutes to uh, test the ability to cut metal in the environment of space. In the next few minutes, we expect to uh, hear word from SpaceX's launch team about the uh, final goal of the t uh, final poll of the team for a go or no go for propellant loading and launch. That poll, that electronic poll should be underway at this time. And if all stations are go, then the uh, fueling of the Falcon 9 with kerosene and liquid oxygen will get underway at T minus 35 minutes. SpaceX does have a 57 minute launch window today, uh, but once the propellant loading begins, the launch window will become instantaneous and SpaceX will be committed to launching at 2.27 p.m. or else wait until the backup day tomorrow. And that's because of uh, the Falcon 9's use of super chilled or densified propellant. And uh, the Falcon 9 does not have the ability to uh, remain a, in a stable replenish state uh, for a long period of time. So once the propellant loading begins, uh, SpaceX has to launch at the appointed time or else uh, drain the propellant and try again tomorrow. The densified propellant gives uh, SpaceX uh, boost uh, the Falcon 9 rocket a boost in performance, so it adds additional, uh, basically allows uh, SpaceX to uh, cram more propellant into the tanks of the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, giving it plenty of performance to haul heavy payloads into orbit, as well as uh, leaving enough leftover propellant reserve for the landing of the first stage booster, which SpaceX refurbishes and reuses.
Now less than 39 minutes from launch. We're standing by for word from SpaceX launch control that the team down at the launch control center just south of Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is go for propellant loading and launch. That go call should be coming shortly in preparation for the start of the countdown or the final auto sequence and propellant loading sequence at T minus 35 minutes. This launch director in the countdown net. We're going to stop the clock and hold here prior to starting propellant load for approximately 30 minutes to allow additional time to complete some additional uh, thermal tests on a PMM module used for payload deployment. So we'll sit tight here. Uh, launch control, I see you stop the clock. Again, we'll sit here for approximately 30 minutes pending a final update from the avionics team. And we just heard from SpaceX uh, launch control that the uh, countdown clock will be holding for approximately 30 minutes uh, in order to complete some thermal testing. So the launch will not be occurring at 2.27 p.m. The launch window extends until 3.24 p.m. Eastern Time or 19.24 UTC. But uh, the SpaceX uh, launch director reports that the countdown will be stopping now or holding now for around 30 minutes to complete some thermal testing. And we'll stand by for further word from SpaceX on uh, the nature of that testing and the outcome and whether the launch uh, will be able to proceed today. Just to clarify the reason for this uh, hold in the countdown, the hold was uh, called by SpaceX's launch team to complete some thermal testing on the payload module. Uh, the payload module presumably uh, refers to the uh, a portion of the payload segment on top of the Falcon 9 rocket, the payload fairing that contains 59 small, satellite and re uh, small satellites and research experiments heading to orbit uh, on this Transporter 5 mission.
RC launch director, Captain Nett. RC. Would you coordinate a new T0 time of 1835 UTC? We'll go. And we've just heard from uh, SpaceX Launch Control a, a minute or so ago that the new launch time is being targeted for 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time or 18.35 UTC. So we'll stand by. The clock should be resuming momentarily. And the countdown clock has resumed. Liftoff targeted for 2.35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 18.35 UTC. Venting tanks for propellant load. And countdown looking for final buys for propellant load and launch go no ghost at 5972. And on countdown, a reminder of abort instructions for non-urgent no-go conditions. Brief CERL DNL approval aborting the countdown for urgent 
issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto immediately and proceed to launch abort auto. At T-minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands-off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Launch auto is started. The countdown clock just passed T-minus 35 minutes. And the uh, launch auto sequence has started. This begins the process of loading rocket-grade kerosene and liquid oxygen into the Falcon 9 rocket out on pad 40. You're looking live at a, a view of the Falcon 9 on complex 40 from our vantage point a few miles to the west. Liftoff has been uh, delayed about eight minutes this afternoon and is now targeted for 2.35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 18.35 UTC to begin the Transporter 5 mission carrying a, a slew of small satellites and research payloads into orbit. This mission will be targeting a polar orbit about 525 kilometers or 325 miles in altitude. And there are 59 uh, customer payloads on board this mission. That includes uh, a number of uh, separating deployable payloads, more than 40 of those, as well as a, a handful of hosted payloads and experiments that will remain attached attached either to the rocket or to uh, a host spacecraft. Now less than 32 minutes to go until launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, happening uh, simultaneously with today's countdown and launch of the Falcon 9 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is the planned undocking of Boeing's Starliner crew capsule from the International Space Station. This uh, Starliner spacecraft has been docked at the station for five days on an unpiloted test flight that is uh, paving the way for uh, future flights on the Starliner with astronauts on board. That uh, Starliner undocking is being broadcast on NASA television and is available to watch also in spaceflightnow.com. The undocking of the Starliner spacecraft from the ISS is scheduled for 2.36 p.m. at about uh, T plus one minute in the Falcon 9 flight today. So about a minute after the Falcon 9 launches, uh, Boeing's Starliner will be undocking and separating from the International Space Station to begin its journey back to Earth. Uh, landing of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft at uh, White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico is scheduled for 6.49 p.m. Eastern Time. 
That's 4.49 p.m. Mountain Time or 22.49 UTC this evening. Now, about 30 minutes left in the countdown here at Cape Canaveral. In this view of uh, Launch Complex 40, you can see some ice and frost beginning to build up on the Falcon 9, a band of white visible on the Falcon 9 booster. This is uh, caused by the loading of super cold liquid oxygen, which has chilled several hundred degrees below zero, causing that ice and frost to build up on the outer skin of the Falcon 9. This is normal and not an issue, but uh, you can actually watch the propellant tanks being filled and, and approximate the level of, uh, of oxidizer in that tank as the level of frost and ice rises on the first stage booster. Again, if you're just joining our coverage of the Transporter 5 mission, the launch has been rescheduled or delayed till 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time, about eight minutes later than the original advertised launch time. Uh, this was to allow a SpaceX to complete some additional thermal testing on a, a payload module or a system associated with the payload deployment uh, system on the Falcon 9. Uh, presumably that testing was completed satisfactorily uh, initially, SpaceX's launch director said this could uh, delay the launch by up to 30 minutes, but uh, the countdown resumed after only an eight-minute hold, and liftoff is now scheduled from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time, or 18.35 UTC. You're continuing to see the propellant loading process uh, here at Pad 40 with the level of frost and ice 
continuing to expand and grow up the length of that first stage booster. At the bottom of the first stage, at the very bottom of the first stage, is the kerosene tank. Uh, that is not stored at cryogenic temperature, so no ice will be building up there. But above the kerosene fuel tank is the liquid oxygen tank, and you're seeing some of the uh, ice and frost uh, developing in a band uh, near the bottom of that LOX tank, that liquid oxygen tank, and the ice will uh, continue to rise up the uh, length of that booster over the next 25 minutes or so until the first stage is fully loaded with its liquid oxygen uh, oxidizer supply. Uh, this kerosene and liquid oxygen will be consumed by nine Merlin 1D engines at the bottom of the first stage. The second stage burns the same propellant mix kerosene and liquid oxygen. And then above that uh, second stage is the payload fairing containing the 59 small satellites and research experiments heading to space today on SpaceX's Transporter 5 rideshare flight. Now less than 24 minutes from launch. If you want to support our coverage and also get uh, add to your collection of uh, space patches, you can go to shop.spaceflightnow.com. This particular patch we have on sale, among others, is the uh, NASA patch for the upcoming SpaceX CRS-25 cargo mission to the International Space Station. This cargo flight is scheduled for launch on June the 9th from here at the Kennedy Space Center carrying uh, several tons of equipment and provisions up to the International Space Station. Uh, this patch uh, shows uh, a Dragon, hence uh, uh, recognizing the Dragon spacecraft that SpaceX will be delivering cargo in up to the space station. also has the uh, four-leaf clover, which has been a hallmark of all SpaceX mission patches uh, dating back uh, more than 15 years. Uh, back until the uh, first successful flight of SpaceX's Falcon 1 rocket. Uh, every SpaceX patch uh, since then has incorporated this four-leaf clover for good luck. So go to shop.spaceflightnow.com, uh, see our collection of patches. You can pick uh, your favorites or pick all of them and uh, add to your collection. We appreciate any support uh, that uh, you can provide through our store and uh, proceeds go to helping improve our coverage of launch activity here at Cape Canaveral. Now 22 minutes and 30 seconds from launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Pro propellant loading continuing to proceed at this point. In the next couple of minutes we should hear confirmation that the Second stage kerosene tank is full. And a few minutes later, the liquid oxygen should be loading, in, loading into the second stage. And this will be uh, happening in parallel with the continued uh, flow of propellant into stage one.
T minus 20 minutes, you can see uh, oxygen gas vapor now venting away from the strong back. Stage two fuel look. This is uh, normal at this point in the countdown. The so-called big vent uh, represents when uh, chill down of the liquid oxygen transfer lines running up the uh, strong back to the right of the Falcon 9 uh, begins. That chill down procedure thermally conditions the liquid oxygen transfer lines for the start of liquid o oxygen loading into the second stage. That uh, should be getting underway at about T minus 16 minutes. And we've heard confirmation now from SpaceX Launch Control that the RP-1 or rocket grade kerosene fuel load has been completed on the second stage. That's the first of four propellant tanks that are being loaded during this countdown. In parallel with the propellant loading is the uh, loading of helium pressurant into the Falcon 9. That helium is used to maintain pressure in the Falcon 9 propellant tanks as the propellants are consumed by the engines in flight. T minus 18 minutes and 10 seconds. Again, this mission is designated Transporter 5. It's the fifth dedicated small satellite rideshare mission that SpaceX has launched. The first one was back in January of 2021. Uh, this mission will be carrying 59 small satellites and research payloads into orbit for a variety of commercial customers, as well as NASA and the U.S. Uh, military's Missile Defense Agency. Uh, this is a sampling of some of the satellites that are going up on this mission on the left is a, a small satellite, a microsatellite, from a company called Hawkeye 360 uh, that's uh, building out a constellation of small satellites to uh, monitor and uh, detect and characterize the, source, the sources of radio frequency emissions. Uh, this data is useful for things like locating uh, radar equipment uh, as well as locating uh, mar uh, mar maritime vessels, ships at sea. And Hawkeye 360's satellite, one of, three of these satellites are actually on board this mission. One of them is pictured on the left. You can see one of the technicians working with the satellite for scale. On the right, uh, on the lower right, is a, a satellite called PTD-3, Pathfinder Technology Demonstration 3. This is a NASA a CubeSat carrying a laser communications experiment called T-Bird that will be testing the ability of uh, small satellites to uh, lock on to a, a laser uh, telescope on Earth and then transmitting data through that optical link uh, at uh, higher data rates than possible through uh, conventional radio means. On the upper right is a view of uh, a CubeSat uh, being loaded with uh, uh, tubes basically basically containing cremated remains from uh, people who can... Uh, stage two lock float. We've just heard stage two lock load uh, is beginning. The second stage of the Falcon 9 is now being loaded with liquid oxygen. A uh, company called Celestis actually offers uh, family members of, uh, of uh, deceased individuals to uh, have their cremated remains uh, flown into space, and these are uh, two of the tubes containing uh, remains of individuals that are going up on this mission. Forty-seven individuals are being represented on this flight from five different custom, uh, countries. Another payload on this mission uh, from NASA is the Rendezvous and Proximity Operations Experiment, the CubeSat uh, Rendezvous Experiment. Uh, this uh, involves two identical CubeSats, each about the size of a shoebox, that are launched together. And once in space, the spacecraft will uh, separate and then perform various maneuvers around each other in orbit over the course of several months, uh, demonstrating the ability of uh, very small satellites to approach one another and maintain uh, proximity operations uh, near each other. Uh, th these are activities that are customarily and, and typically done by larger spacecraft, but uh, with the miniaturization of satellite technology now feasible with small sats, and this will be demonstrated uh, by this NASA experiment going up on today's mission. 
Now T minus 15 minutes and counting. Everything looking good for launch at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's 18.35 UTC. Propellant loading progressing uh, normally at this time. The second stage uh, kerosene tank is full. The second stage liquid oxygen tank just started loading. And propellant's uh, well underway uh, during the loading process on stage one. You can see that ice level on the first stage continuing to rise nearing the top of the first stage at this point. T minus 11 minutes and 15 seconds. Today's Transporter 5 rideshare mission will be targeting a polar orbit. This means the Falcon 9 rocket will be heading southeast initially from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and then turn uh, south on a more southerly trajectory uh, after separation of the Falcon 9 first stage. This maneuver is known as a dog leg and allows or ensures the Falcon 9 does not uh, fly over any populated areas, but as you can see, it'll be flying just offshore of uh, West Palm Beach and Miami and then heading out over the Florida Straits and over Cuba, ultimately over the uh, Caribbean Sea and then Central America before merging over the Pacific Ocean. So this uh, gr uh, red uh, uh, trace shows the approximate ground track for today's mission and the first stage uh, will be returning to landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, hence the lack of uh, a label for the drone ship. So there's no drone ship landing today. The booster will be returning to landing zone one about six miles or 10 kilometers from the launch pad. This shows uh, this list of uh, major flight events. 
uh, shows the uh, major milestones for today's mission. After liftoff, the Falcon 9 will be exceeding the speed of sound, again heading southeast downrange over the Atlantic Ocean about a minute after liftoff. At uh, T plus 2 minutes and 16 seconds, the first stage engines will be shut down. Those nine engines will, will cut off, allowing the first stage booster to separate from the second stage a few seconds later. And then the second stage engine will light, its, uh, will light, will light uh, T plus 2 minutes and 27 seconds. And uh, moments later, the first stage will relight three of its engines for a so-called boost back burn. This allows the first stage to essentially uh, reverse course, uh, cancel out its downrange velocity, and then begin its return flight to Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So uh, the first stage uh, boost back burn and the second stage burn will be occurring at about the same time in the skies over uh, Cape Canaveral this afternoon. The uh, first stage will uh, continue its descent, uh, perform an entry burn, and then finally uh, landing of the first stage at landing zone one uh, out near the tip of Cape Canaveral is scheduled for T plus eight minutes and 33 seconds, about the same time of the cutoff of the second stage engine to insert the 59 payloads into an, a preliminary or parking orbit uh, moments after that, the first experiment on today's mission, uh, the Outpost Mars Demo 1 payload from NanoRacks will get underway. This tech demo is designed to uh, demonstrate the uh, cutting of metal in space for the first time. Uh, we talked a little bit about that at the beginning of our broadcast, but this is essentially a, an experiment in metalworks in space uh, designed to uh, demonstrate a technology that could be used in the future to uh, manufacture components in orbit as well as convert uh, used upper stages into uh, into the uh, falcon into uh, habitats that are useful for experiments and uh, 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 other payloads in orbit. This is the target orbit for today's uh, mission. Uh, the Falcon 9 upper stage will be uh, reaching a, an orbit about 326 miles or 525 kilometers, a near circular orbit. And again, it's a polar orbit, a sun-synchronous orbit, at an inclination of 97.5 degrees to the equator. This booster is booster number 1061 in SpaceX's inventory. This booster has flown seven times before. It's making its eighth trip to space today. It uh, debuted, as you can see in this graph, back in November 2020 with the uh, NASA Crew-1 mission carrying four astronauts to the space station. Uh, it landed on a drone ship and then was refurbished for another crew launch last April. And since then, it's flown a number of commercial and NASA missions, uh, launching the uh, X SXM-8 radio broadcasting satellite for Sirius XM, a Dragon cargo flight to the space station last August, uh, NASA's XB X-ray astronomy mission, a Starlink internet satellite deployment flight uh, in February, and then most recently it launched on April the 1st on SpaceX's Transporter 4 mission, a uh, very similar flight to today's. This was the uh, previous flight in SpaceX's SmallSat rideshare program. Today's mission, the eighth flight for this booster, this mission uh, designated Transporter 5 in SpaceX's uh, launch manifest. Now T minus six minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, about 30 seconds ago, the chill down of the Merlin first stage engines got underway. This is a process to thermally condition the Merlin power plants at the bottom of the first stage in preparation for ignition. That ignition sequence will begin at T minus three seconds. In the next few uh, minutes, the Falcon 9's guidance system will be configured for flight. Uh, the Mars uh, demo, the uh, Outpost Mars demo mission is launching as a payload on the rideshare uh, mission by SpaceX. T minus six minutes and counting. In the next few minutes, the Falcon 9's guidance system will be configured for flight. The autonomous flight termination system on the SpaceX uh, rocket will also be confirmed ready for flight today. This is the system that would uh, automatically destroy the rocket and terminate the flight in the event of a failure or if it uh, veers off course and uh, deviates from its uh, pre-approved flight path. Also in about a minute's time, the strong back on the right side of the uh, view here, this is a now a different view from the ITL causeway uh, south of the launch pad. You can still see that strong back uh, actually in the foreground in front of the rocket in this vantage point. That'll be retracted to an angle of about 1.8 degrees from the rocket, beginning at about T minus four and a half minutes.
Tank suppressing for strong back retract. Now less than four minutes to go until launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket back recheck. on the Transporter 5 mission. Stage one lock flow complete. Less than three minutes to go. Less than two minutes until launch of SpaceX's Transporter 5 rideshare mission. The Falcon 9 rocket is now fully loaded, weighing about a million pounds after the completion of loading of kerosene and liquid oxygen. Gas launch close out. T-minus 60 okay, seconds. At this point, the Falcon 9 is transitioning to internal power. And the Falcon 9's onboard computer is taking command of the countdown. The propellant tanks will be pressurized for flight in the next few moments. T-minus 40 seconds. Vent go for launch. are now closing uh, to pressurize those tanks. We just heard the final go from launch from SpaceX's launch director. T-minus 30. T-minus 30 seconds. T minus 25, the ignition sequence begins at T minus 3 seconds for the nine Merlin 1D main engines. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, T minus 5, 7, 4, 6, 5, 3, 4, 3, 2, 2, engine ignition. One. Zero. And liftoff of SpaceX's Ignition Falcon 9 rocket beginning the Transporter 5 mission 
carrying 59 small satellites and research payloads into One orbit. chamber pressure is nominal. Vehicles pitching down range. Power telemetry nominal. Vehicle supersonic. Max Q. T plus 90 seconds in the last uh, few moments we've heard confirmation that the Falcon 9 has passed the speed of sound, surpassed the speed of Mach 1, and has also uh, reached and uh, cleared the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure or max Q. This is the period of time when the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle are greatest. T plus two minutes, a few moments away from engine cutoff and staging now. Uh, that'll be a beginning of a fast-paced uh, series of events uh, to allow the first stage but to begin its return to Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Okay. And we have visual confirmation of main engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. We're now switching over to uh, SpaceX's uh, live stream, which is on a bit of a delay, about a 30-second uh, latency in this feed. So you're looking at a view of the Falcon 9 uh, from the Falcon 9 looking uh, back toward Florida. And you'll see the staging event uh, momentarily here. Wonderful view from a tracking camera showing stage separation and ignition of the um, MVAC engine on the second stage to continue the uh, mission up into orbit. The first stage beginning its boost back burn now, three engines firing at the bottom of that first stage to uh, guide that they booster back, back toward Cape Canaveral. Fairing separation confirmed. For confirmation of fairing separation, the payload shroud has jettisoned to reveal, reveal those small sats to the environment of space for the first time. shows the payload fairing jettison as it occurred. Vehicle on nominal trajectory.
plus five minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, the real-time clock since launch on the upper right in this screen. Again, this view from SpaceX is SpaceX is on about a 30-second uh, delay uh, due to uh, latency. On the left, you see Cape Canaveral in view, a beautiful shot from the first stage booster looking straight down, uh, more or less, at Florida's Space Coast. You can see some cloud cover over the area. Uh, we're located at Kennedy Space Center, a few miles away from the launch pad. On the right, you see the Merlin vacuum engine continuing to fire. Uh, beautiful hues of the Atlantic Ocean in view over the Bahamas. Everything looking good, six minutes into the flight. Stage two, FTS is saved. Stage one, entry burn startup. Gate yeah, closed now, we're not trajectory. That entry burn has been completed now. Stage one entry burn shut down. Here you can see the entry burn as it occurred a few moments ago. Three engines firing. Stage one FTS is saved. Start of terminal guidance. Stage Eight minutes into the launch. flight, landing is uh, less than a minute away for the first stage. Now you're seeing stage a live view burn. of that first stage coming back to Earth on its final descent uh, toward landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Going to be passing behind the trees here, that landing burn underway. Beautiful shot of the 15-story uh, booster coming back to Earth. We're going to switch back to uh, SpaceX's feed now. This will show an onboard view with a little bit of delay of that stage first one stage landing. landing. Boy. I'm back shut down. Stage one landing confirmed. Beautiful shot. Uh, Outpost Mars Demo 1. We just heard a double sonic first. boom here Stopping at the Space Center. Starting. Heralding the booster's return, completing its eighth flight to space. And landing confirmed. Booster number 1061 has returned to landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. This was this particular rocket's eighth flight to space. Coming back uh, for refurbishment, for another try, another mission. This was the 122nd successful landing of a Falcon booster. Lots of signal, Cape. So we heard confirmation now at T plus 10 minutes uh, of the cutoff of the first stage or the second stage uh, engine. 
This uh, occurred after reaching a preliminary orbit. At this time, the uh, NanoRex Outpost Mars demo metal cutting experiment should be underway. Uh, the data from that experiment will be recorded and downlinked to a ground station uh, later in the flight over the coming uh, minutes to hours uh, for analysis by NanoRacks engineers. And uh, NanoRacks officials have said they don't expect to uh, have a, a, a clear picture and a clear understanding of uh, the success and outcome of the experiment until perhaps uh, uh, late today or tomorrow.
Now T plus 30 minutes and 40 seconds into the Transporter 5 mission. The Falcon 9 rocket continues its uh, coast period. About 25 minutes or so from the restart of the second stage engine to maneuver the uh, payloads into their deployment orbit at an altitude of about 326 or 525 kilometer, 326 miles or 525 kilometers. The Falcon, Falcon 9 rocket uh, lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time or 18.35 UTC. And the initial phases of t uh, today's flight uh, went according to plan with the cutoff of the first stage about 2 minutes and 16 seconds after liftoff, followed uh, moments later by separation of that first stage booster, which returned to a uh, vertical landing accompanied by sonic booms here at Cape Canaveral. That landing occurred about eight and a half minutes after liftoff over on landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at about the same time as the uh, second stage of the Falcon 9 reached its preliminary or parking orbit and began this coast phase. This coast phase uh, began about 23 minutes ago, about halfway through that coast phase now because we're now 23 minutes away from the restart of the second stage engine it's scheduled for T plus 55 minutes.
Now 41 minutes since the launch of the Transporter 5 mission. One of the payloads on this flight is a new orbital transfer vehicle developed by a company called Momentus. Uh, this orbital transfer vehicle is designed to uh, ferry small satellites to, into different altitudes and different inclinations after deploying from a large rocket after launch. And this uh, Vigo Ride orbital transfer vehicle is being demonstrated in space for the first time after uh, separating from the Falcon 9 on today's flight. We spoke with the CEO of Momentus, John Rood, yesterday to talk about the new orbital transfer vehicle. So John, thank you for joining us today. Um, your orbital transfer vehicle is on the Transporter 5 mission. It's gonna be demonstrated in space for the first time. Can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be testing and what sets your technology apart from other companies? Well, Stephen, this is an exciting and historic week for Momentus. Our Vigoride orbital transfer vehicle is scheduled to make its first flight to space. And what it will do is the orbital transfer vehicle uh, that we call Vigoride is very versatile. It can carry small satellites, cube satellites, nano satellites, Pico satellites, all simultaneously. And it uses a, a water-based propellant uh, and a microwave electrothermal thruster. And so what will be done on this flight is this is the, the first demonstration flight of the vehicle. The principal objective is of course to test the vehicle. Um, it will go to space, unfurl its solar panels, orient itself, uh, communicate with the earth and, and allow us to control it. And then after we deploy customer payloads on this mission, then we're going to do some demonstration maneuvers. Uh, the customers that we, we plan to launch, um, this is a very exciting moment for us as well. We have customers on Vigride as well as on a second port using a third party deployer system. And this water-based uh, propellant that you're using, uh, how much detail can you go into about, you know, what do you mean by water-based? Is it, is it H2O or is it some uh, mixture that you've, you've, you've it's, got? It's H2O, it's water. Um, and so actually you could strike the word based, it's water <laughs> as a propellant. And essentially uh, the way this works is similar to the microwave that you use in your home. We use microwave energy uh, with a magnetron to uh, heat water vapor to a temperature that's roughly half the temperature of the surface of the sun. And then the real science comes into controlling that resulting plasma, making sure it doesn't just melt through everything inside, including your nozzle. And then uh, controlling that plasma to uh, expel it through the rocket nozzle to therefore produce thrust. Has anything like this been tested in space before at a, you know, either at a different scale or a slightly different chemistry, or is this totally new or is this a new spin on things that you've put on? The microwave electrothermal thruster technology has been in development since the 1980s by university researchers. But Momentus is the first, uh, and we're a real pioneer in bringing it to the marketplace and using it in space. Uh, the company in 2019 did do a demonstration of a, a scale version of the thruster, but we're uh, generations beyond that and using a very different system now due to the progressions. And so this will be the really the first uh, full-scale usage of the technology in space. And that's why it's a test mission, a demonstration mission. Obviously, we expect to learn a lot. Uh, while we're, we're very optimistic about the performance, uh, I'm certain we're going to learn things. <laughs> I, I in the history of space flight, it's very unusual for first flights to be flawless. And so, um, you know, we're looking at this with the experience born of a lot of years in the space industry by our team uh, and realistic expectations, but also a lot of optimism about what we can do with this technology. Um, the ISP or specific impulse uh, is uh, has the potential to be higher than chemical propellants. And we, uh, we also like the idea that versus electric uh, thrusters, things like Hall effect thrusters, you're getting substantially higher levels of thrust. So we, we fit kind of a sweet spot between chemical propellants and electrical propulsion that we think is gonna be very attractive to customers. And you know, that was something I was gonna ask you about the thrust level in ISP, um, but can you also talk about uh, you know, some, some, some numbers about this, about this mission, how many thrusters are on the spacecraft and the orbital transfer vehicle, you know, how, how big is this thing you know, in terms of kilograms or specifications uh, volume wise? Sure, the, the Vigoride orbital transfer vehicle is, uh, has two microwave electrothermal thrusters and uh, in part 
to allow for a redundancy uh, should there be some issue. There's a number of other redundancies built into the spacecraft to provide robustness in its design. And so that, that's one of the, the virtues that we see with our vehicle. Um, again, you never plan for any issues to occur in space, but the reality is space professionals watching your broadcast will know things do happen. And, and if you're wise, you prepare for those contingencies, which we are trying to do. Um, and then, you know, with respect to the, the other parts, uh, the vehicle uh, right now, it's, you know, it's roughly four feet by four feet. Uh, so, you know, not a, uh, not a huge vehicle, but certainly pleasant, pl plenty large to carry the kind of uh, payloads that we want. While we, this is an initial mission, we won't be anywhere near the full payload capacity. We do uh, have the ability to carry up to, or it's designed to carry up to 500 kilograms of payload. Again, a combination of small satellites, cube satellites, nano satellites, femto satellites, whatever the, the size may be. And we, we can reconfigure the vehicle to simultaneously, well, to deliver different payloads at different parts of the mission profile. And I, I see the artist illustration <laughs> behind you. It looks like it has deployable solar panels. So that's good for extended operations in orbit. That's right. Uh, we've got two uh, solar panel arrays that will deploy from either side. Uh, the vehicle does have the ability when they're in stowed configuration uh, to generate power from, from one of the faces of the, the four that unfurl per side. But uh, after we're in orbit, we'll, we'll uh, command the vehicle. Uh, it will unfurl its solar panels, orient itself. We have the ability, of course, to, uh, to adjust them to face different uh, locations initially. Um, you know, for example, 180 degrees orientation opposite each other as the spacecraft orients itself. And there's a number of other uh, design features that it has. In the illustration behind me, of course, it's releasing a, a small satellite. Uh, could very well be any other configuration. This is just representative of, of what we plan to do. And uh, th this mission, you mentioned you have some customers. I understand it's primarily a demonstration, uh, but uh, can you talk about you know, how many uh, CubeSats or uh, small sats you'll actually be deploying from the vehicle, how many hosted payloads you have on board. And then, uh, you know, just talk about what's actually, you know, in terms of customers, who are, who's, who's on this mission, how many? Sure. We have uh, three customers flying with us on the orbital transfer vehicle called Vigoride. And then we have other customers, uh, one that is ours and, and four other satellites provided by three customers on this second port. Um, which will use a third-party deployer. But speaking of the, the payloads on Vigoride, uh, the customers that are on there, one is called FOSA Systems, and then another one is Orbit NTNU. Uh, for FOSA, they, we're going to deploy a series of uh, small satellites that will uh, be used to test an Internet of Things configuration. These are, uh, you know, the, the company there, FOSA Systems uh, is deploying multiple PICO satellites as part of this constellation to provide real-time Internet of Things connectivity for industrial applications. Um, the other customer on board, or a, another customer, I should say, not the only one, uh, Orbit NTNU will be using its payload called SelfieSat to take a selfie from a satellite in space. Um, essentially, the payload has an external screen it displays pictures that are sent up by the public uh, while a camera is mounted on an arm and photographs the screen with the public photos and the earth in the background. And so that's why they call it selfie sat. Um, there's, a, there's a third party, uh, a third payload on board that will carry and, and perform a test for another customer in space. Um, and then on the second port that we purchased on the Falcon 9, we're going to fly a third party deployer from a trusted partner. And we are going to use this deployer. Actually, it'll, it'll place our first customer satellite in space, we believe, due to the timing, uh, which is the satellite's called Bronco Space, is from Bronco Space, I should say, at the California State Polytechnic University at Pomona. Uh, and so that, that payload will be uh, released a little earlier in the sequence. And then there are four other customer satellite payloads that are customers of our partner that will also be placed in orbit. So, um, you know, for us, uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a mission to have a, a number of customers placed in orbit and then have the opportunity to, to put the vehicle through its paces, uh, ring it out, 
see how she does in space. And then obviously it's a test mission. We're going to learn an awful lot from it, but we're very optimistic about what the future holds for us now that we're uh, flying to space and getting a chance to, you know, get some flight heritage, show what we can do and begin servicing our customers to bring this, this vision that's been uh, brewing inside Momentus for some time to life. The Vigorad demonstrations uh, on this particular flight, did those begin after you deploy those uh, satellites from the orbital transfer vehicle then? Yes, we'll, we'll demonstrate some operations of the vehicle initially and then uh, proceed to do, after we've deployed the customers to do, to do other things with the mission and, and really test out the performance of the vehicle, put it through its paces, uh, fire the thrusters multiple times, things of that nature, or at least that's the plan. And, uh, you know, as they say, plans, <laughs> plans have to adjust to reality, but that's what we, we expect to do. And, and we're optimistic about the way this is going to go, go down. The mission, I should add, is, uh, is an extended one. Under our license with the FCC, uh, we have a six-month mission period. So we're going to um, utilize the vehicle for as much of that time as, as it makes sense and put it through its paces, test it, adjust, send up additional uh, adjustments to orient its performance and continue to, to refine it. You were listening to John Rood, who is the CEO of Momentus. Momentus has developed a, an orbital transfer vehicle called Vigo Ride that uses a water-based uh, propellant a propulsion system for orbital maneuvers. And uh, this OTV or orbital transfer vehicle will be demonstrated for the first time after uh, separating from the Falcon 9 rocket this afternoon. And it carries its own uh, payloads, own small sats that it'll be uh, maneuvering into slightly different orbits uh, for deployment. And uh, future Vigoride orbital transfer vehicles will uh, attempt to more aggressive maneuvers in space to change altitude and inclination uh, to allow uh, small satellite owners to uh, pick their orbit and not be uh, uh, have their orbits dictated by a rideshare flight. The Falcon 9 second stage is now passing over the Indian Ocean. It's uh, passed over the Antarctica in the last few minutes, now heading northbound over the Indian Ocean. The restart of the Merlin vacuum engine on stage two is expected in less than two minutes, about a minute and a half from now. And this is a restart of that upper stage engine to maneuver the Falcon 9 into the proper orbit for payload deployment. Acquisition of signal, all it is. We've just seen uh, acquisition of signal. The Falcon 9 now passing in range of a ground station. We got a brief shot of uh, video from the second stage of the Falcon 9 looking at the Merlin engine bell. Less than a minute until that restart of the Merlin vacuum engine. And back ignition. And shutdown. And we've heard a confirmation from SpaceX launch control that the MVAC or Merlin vacuum engine has completed its burn. We may see that uh, in the delayed view from SpaceX's webcast uh, in a short uh, few moments. And just to take a step back, uh, can you talk a little bit about the YouTube? We've heard uh, that the Falcon 9 has reached the nominal orbit for separation of the payloads on board. There are 59 payloads on this mission. 
Uh, most of them are actually deployable payloads. There are a few that are hosted experiments that will either remain attached to the Falcon 9 or are uh, hosted on uh, orbital transfer vehicles uh, such as the Vigo Ride uh, spacecraft that uh, you just heard about a few minutes ago. The spacecraft separation sequence will begin at T plus 59 minutes. That's a little more than two minutes away. Acquisition of signal, Bangalore. Geo Optics, Cicero 2, Vehicle 2, separation confirmed. And the payload Shared deployment that, sequence has begun. Separation confirmed. You will hear periodic call outs over the next few minutes as these spacecraft are deployed one by one. There are NASA 39 separation technology events. Demonstrator 3, separation confirmed. Lemur 2, Karen B, separation confirmed. Your Dineta, separation confirmed. Geo Optics, Cicero 2, Vehicle 1, separation confirmed. Lemur 2, Van Injuries, separation confirmed. Spart 2, separation confirmed. Lemur 2, Tennis Sun Lily, separation confirmed. You're watching a live GHG a live set, camera view from the Falcon 9 upper confirmed. stage showing these uh, small satellites deploying one by one. Planetum 1 and spin 1, separation confirmed.
Beamer 2, ANCOM 1, separation confirmed. GHG set, C3 Luca, separation confirmed. NASA CubeSat, proximity, operations, demonstration, separation confirmed. Connecta, T1.1, separation confirmed. Lemur 2, Nimi, 1307, separation confirmed. GHG set, C5, Diaco, separation confirmed. Roughly half of the uh, spacecraft on the Transporter 5 mission have now been confirmed uh, deployed. Separation confirmed. There are 39 individual discrete uh, separation events planned during this sequence. And now 20 of those uh, separation events have been confirmed by SpaceX. In a short uh, period of time, in a few moments, the Falcon 9 is expected to pass outside the range of a ground station. And uh, the remaining deployments that occur after that Space moment Atari will be confirmed, confirmed. Uh, once the Falcon 9 is back in range of a, uh, another ground station over a different part of the, of, uh, the world. And uh, we'll lose the live video uh, at that time as well. CNCE V4 and CNCE V5 separation confirmed. New set 28, separation confirmed. Sherpa AC1, separation confirmed. Expected loss of signal. Maldives. Veriset 1C, separation confirmed. AMS, separation confirmed. Now 24 of the 39 small satellite separation events have been confirmed by SpaceX. Broncos have one separation confirmed.
New set 29, separation confirmed. SpaceX reports that the upper stage of the Falcon 9 is now passed outside the range of a ground station. Uh, however, we are continuing to see live video, so we're not sure if uh, that's the case or not. In any event, uh, 26 of the 39 separation events have been confirmed at this time. Set 30, separation confirmed. First ice eye, separation confirmed. Expected loss of signal, Bangalore. And now that signal has been lost uh, with the Falcon 9 passing outside the range of a ground station in Bangalore, India. Uh, when that uh, loss of signal occurred, SpaceX uh, had confirmed 28 of the 39 separation events were accomplished, 11 to go. Uh, SpaceX expects to reacquire the signal from the Falcon 9 in about six minutes or so. And at that point, uh, SpaceX hopes to confirm the remainder of the separation events which should be occurring now during this expected loss of signal.
Just a reminder, if you're a patch collector or like to commemorate uh, uh, space missions, you can buy mission patches at the Space Flight Now store. You can visit shop.spaceflightnow.com where you can buy uh, a number of mission patches. Uh, and a sample of those patches is uh, rendered here. On the left is uh, NASA's Artemis patch uh, representing the Artemis moon program. In the middle is the uh, SpaceX CRS-25 patch. This is an upcoming resupply mission to the International Space Station that's scheduled for launch on June the 9th. So that's a very timely patch for a mission set to launch in a couple of weeks. And then on the right is the Crew-4 patch. This is the uh, patch for the mission, uh, the Crew Dragon mission currently docked at the International Space Station. This uh, mission with four astronauts launched from uh, the Kennedy Space Center last month. It's going to uh, run through September and uh, this is the mission patch again for Crew 4 currently at the International Space Station. You can collect these patches and more at shop.spaceflightnow.com That uh, reacquisition of signal is expected in a little more than a minute. The Falcon 9, as you can see in this uh, map showing its ground track, is approaching, it's flying over Russia. It's going to be approaching uh, the Arctic Ocean shortly. And the ground station we expect to hear from next will be the Svalbard ground station in the Arctic Ocean. Ice eye separations confirmed. Blue sat 31 separation confirmed. Umbra separation confirmed. Vigoride separation confirmed. Ion SCV 006 thrilling Thomas separation confirmed.
At this point, SpaceX has confirmed uh, 10 additional satellite deployments for a total of 36 of 39 confirmed complete. Uh, the remaining three deployments that we're still waiting to hear on, hear from, uh, hear about rather, are the Hawkeye 360 radio frequency uh, monitoring satellites. These macro satellites are designed to detect and characterize uh, RF emissions, uh, such as radar radar installations around the world. Other satellites uh, deployed in the last couple of minutes include radar remote sensing payloads for uh, the Finnish company ISI, as well as Earth imaging satellites for uh, the company called Satellogic from Argentina, as well as the VigoRide orbital transfer vehicle for Momentus, which uh, you heard about earlier from Momentus' CEO in our interview with him yesterday. Earlier in the payload deployment sequence, uh, SpaceX called out confirmation of uh, satellite separation sa satellite separation events uh, for payloads from NASA, uh, the U.S. military's Missile Defense Agency, Spire Global, uh, GHGSAT, which is a Canadian company that uh, monitors greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, Geo Optics, which is building out a fleet of uh, commercial weather satellites. Acquisition of signal, Dooley. Hawk 5B separation confirmed. Hawk 5C separation confirmed. And while we wait confirmation of these last deployments, uh, one customer, Sand Logic, reports that they've already established uh, radio communication with their four new Earth observation satellites. And we did just hear confirmation of two additional satellite deployment events. Uh, two of these, two of the three satellites for Hawkeye 360, uh, these are radio frequency monitoring satellites, have uh, deployed from the Falcon 9. We're still standing by for confirmation of the final payload deployment. We're now watching uh, live views once again from the Falcon 9 rocket showing the uh, now uh, bare payload stack after confirming 38 of the 39 payload deployments. The Falcon 9 is now passing in range of a ground station in Greenland, about to complete its first orbit of the Earth following the launch at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral here in Florida.
final Hawkeye satellite separation from Earth. All payload separations confirmed. Now one hour, 26 minutes since the launch of the Transporter 5 mission. You heard uh, just a few moments ago the confirmation from SpaceX launch control that the rideshare deployment sequence has been completed. All uh, 39 separation events have occurred. There are 59 payloads in total on this Transporter 5 rideshare flight, uh, but some of those are either hosted and remain on the rocket or are hosted and remain aboard other satellites. So 45, 59 payloads in all, uh, 39 individual spacecraft separation events completed now. Uh, a successful launch for the Falcon 9 rocket. This was the 22nd uh, launch of a Falcon 9 this year, and also the 22nd orbital launch attempt based out of Florida Space Coast in 2022. There's a bit of a break over the next uh, few days for the rest of May, there are no uh, confirmed launches on our schedule, but the activity picks up again in early June uh, with a series of launches, uh, including two to resupply the International Space Station up ahead. On June 3rd, uh, the June launch calendar will get underway with the launch of a Soyuz rocket. This is a uh, Russian resupply mission, a Progress cargo freighter uh, will be launched to the International Space Station from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan carrying uh, a payload of fuel and food and uh, pressurized air up to the International Space Station as well as water up to the crew on board the space station. That will be followed by the launch uh, no, earlier, no earlier than Sunday, June 6th of a Rocket Lab Electron vehicle. This uh, small satellite launch vehicle will take off from Rocket Lab's privately owned spaceport in New Zealand. It will be carrying a small NASA payload called Capstone and through a series of burns over a course of uh, weeks to months, the uh, kick stage or uh, uh, spacecraft bus that is carrying the capstone experiment will perform a series of burns to uh, propel capstone toward the moon, and ultimately capstone will be captured into an orbit around the moon for a, a, uh, a host of communications and deep space navigation experiments. The capstone mission is uh, operated and managed un under the umbrella of NASA's Artemis moon program and it's actually going to the same orbit that NASA intends to use to uh, build out and operate the planned gateway station, a mini space station in orbit around the moon. On June the 9th, uh, SpaceX will be back in action with the uh, launch of a Falcon 9 rocket with the CRS-25 resupply flight. A Cargo Dragon capsule will be launched uh, to the International Space Station from Pad 39A here at the Kennedy Space Center. And then on June 10th, another SpaceX mission is uh, on the calendar for launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This will be carrying a TV broadcasting satellite for the Egyptian operator Nilesat. Uh, this will be heading into a geostationary transfer orbit, uh, heading up ultimately to a perch in geosynchronous orbit, uh, more than 22,000 miles over the equator. So this is uh, the look at the next few launches that we have uh, on our launch schedule from uh, sites around the world. Again, uh, one caveat I always share is there may be other launches on, this, on the uh, launch calendar that may pop up over the next few days. 
Once we get confirmation of those launch dates, we'll post them on our launch schedule on spaceflightnow.com. Uh, for example, uh, we do expect uh, sometime in the first half of June the launch of the next uh, Chinese astronaut crew to the Chinese space station, but we don't have a confirmed launch date for that flight just yet. So uh, with that, uh, just to recap one more time, SpaceX's Transporter 5 rideshare flight took off at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 18.35 UTC from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And uh, a little about an hour and a half later now, all uh, 39 spacecraft separation events have been confirmed complete. Uh, SpaceX has uh, declared success. The first stage booster uh, returned to landing zone one at Cape Canaveral for an on-target landing to complete its eighth trip to space. So SpaceX's 22nd mission of the year now in the books. Uh, the next SpaceX launch, as I mentioned, uh, scheduled for June 7th, June 9th rather with the Dragon cargo mission to the space station. Later this evening, we'll be covering the uh, landing of Boeing's Starliner crew capsule uh, in New Mexico. That uh, Starliner spacecraft undocked from the International Space Station uh, just one minute after the launch of the Falcon 9 rocket here in Florida. Uh, that Starliner spacecraft has now departed the vicinity of the space station and is heading for a landing at White Sands Space Harbor in southern New Mexico at uh, 6.49 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.49 p.m. Mountain Time, or 22.49 UTC. And uh, that uh, Starliner spacecraft will be approaching White Sands uh, from the southwest, flying over the Pacific Ocean, and then over Mexico, and uh, over the, uh, near the uh, Texas-New Mexico border, targeting a landing at White Sands Space Harbor, uh, co-located at the U.S. Army's White Sands Missile Range at 6.49 p.m. Eastern Time. That landing will complete the Starliner test flight uh, to the space station that launched last week from here at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Uh, this was a demo mission intended to uh, prove out the Starliner systems, uh, prove out the uh, crew capsule, and uh, demonstrate that the spacecraft is ready to carry astronauts to the space station on its next test flight, uh, which could occur uh, by the end of the year or in early 2023. An official schedule for that uh, Starliner crew flight will be forthcoming after the return of the unpiloted, unpiloted test flight uh, today. So thank you again for joining us for the launch of the Transporter 5 mission. It's been a very busy uh, month, been a very busy few months here at Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. And the day's not over with the landing of the Starliner spacecraft still a couple hours away. Until next time, I'm Stephen Clark from the Kennedy Space Center from spaceflightnow.com. Have a great day.